Welcome back, everyone, to Gatherverse.live, the 3M Music Summit. My name is Christopher Lafayette, and I want to welcome our audience and all of our guests for a roundtable that we have for this particular discussion, the global sound of community in the metaverse. I will introduce our panelists who come to join us for this extensive roundtable today. Panelists, I ask that you mute your mics until we begin the session and when it's called upon. And I will introduce all of you with who we have with us today. First one to introduce, we have Mandy Morris, a mental health expert, clinical director, LPC, EMDR clinician. We also have with us today, Russell Bundy of Smite Media, LTD, who's the CEO and co-founder. Cynthia Payne, the founder of Specular Offerings. We also have with us today, Adrian Rashad Driscoll, head of immersive collimation and Stephen Korn, president of Viewpoint Consulting Services, the faculty of Los Angeles College of Music. Everyone, we'd like to welcome you to this particular session where we're gonna lean in and take the baton of what's already been carried forward. Audience, strap in, the mayor gather be well. As we go further into the exploration of music and the evolution, we see it evolving and changing. We've been seeing it all of our lives for the many years, decades, and even over centuries, really since the beginning of time, if you will, that we've just seen such a difference in the type of music, the different culture that it fosters, its relation with fashion, its relation with life itself, humanity, globally, transmetropolitan, city to city, country to country, throughout different continents, what music means. We're gonna lean in a little bit more and get a little bit beneath the surface on the details of what we're looking and doing with the metaverse and respects. But before we do that, I want to go and touch around and I want each speaker to go and we'll start with Mandy and we'll go round Robin. Mandy, what does music mean to you from your professional lens? Yeah, and hi, nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, music is, it expresses so things so much deeper than, than just words and conversations can articulate. And in my field and in the mental health field, and I often use music at times for emotional recovery, for mental health needs, for um, ways to help people get through crisis and tough times. Um, on a neuroscience level, music uh, extends to all parts of the brain. And in that sense, can provide a lot of relief, a lot of inspiration, um, has many benefits to it. And so for me in my field, um, music can be a very healing thing. Stephen, let's jump on that. Mandy, thank you. From your lens, what is music to you today? Let's unlike. Steven, we have to unmute you. Yeah, I've only been doing the, you know, Zooming for, for 10 years. You're good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, I, there's a famous English philosopher, writer named Atlas Huxley, and I think he put it best for me that after silence, that which comes nearest to expressing the inexpressible is music. Well said. Cynthia, we'll throw the same with you. Music from your lens. Yeah, I'm going to riff off what uh, Mandy said uh, about um, music being quite therapeutic. Um, you know, someone who maybe has Alzheimer's can't remember his wife of 50 years, but remembers the words to a song that, that they uh, learned as a child or growing up or, uh, you know, it's just amazing how far reaching music is and how it does reach all parts of the brain. So I think, you know, uh, this idea of connecting with the content of a song and how it moves us. Um, is so powerful. Adrian, let's rope it in. How are we looking? Yeah, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think music is the subjective connector. You know, it people may not look a certain way or or act a certain way or even, you know, be in any demographic that's similar. But music, for some reason, has that connective capability. And I, I think that's that's how you build a community. It's it's community builder. Well stated. Russell. Yeah, and I also think um from just like the events kind of point of view and like, you know, for the party and sign and stuff like that, I think it's also brings people together to not only just to collaborate, but also to have a good time with each other, to actually enjoy special moments with each other and to have that relatability so that when you hear that song in like five, ten years time, you can listen listen back to it and think, Oh my god, I remember that song, I remember having the party and it, it gives you that kind of a rememberability as well, um, to it and give you those special moments. So um that's kind of my side of things, too. Indeed. Let's go. And we're going to go round robin in different ways, but we're going to have a lot of fun with this. And almost a rapid fire sense. Cynthia, let's go ahead and bring you in. When we talk about insurance of accessibility, uh, we talked about that in our panel earlier today with our first roundtable on a whole lot about accessibility and how do musicians access the metaverse and try to understand what it is. But now when we access the metaverse as a musician, as an indie, or even maybe someone that is a little more known and established, question, how do we ensure equality in the music metaverse? This is a huge question, accessibility, um, equality, um, giving everyone uh, a chance to access these high tech uh, really, um, platforms. Um, UNESCO, uh, UNESCO says that uh, almost 50% of the world does not have internet at home. So I think that probably the most critical thing is to uh, look at ways to increase uh, the internet at home um, to close the digital divide. The pandemic really brought the digital divide back into focus uh, as a critical need. And we also have applications now that enable musicians to connect with one another from home using their home internet. So this is a great way to um, ensure equality uh, by using these apps, anyone can use them. And then we can merge those apps with metaverse platforms. We can right now we have to run them alongside one another because the delay in metaverse platforms is too high for musicians to be able to play live together. Uh, but for maybe the the name artists that, that want to have concerts, again, increasing the accessibility to technology and home internet and closing the digital divide, I think really critical matters here. Indeed, Stephen, how can we build community in the metaverse as it relates to music? Unmute. There we go, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. You're getting better, Stephen. Yeah. I'm getting better, yeah, what can I say? Um, well, there's a great risk in the metaverse being controlled by the same three mega companies that control m most of our internet, right? And, um, you know, you look at Facebook, uh, Google, and Amazon, and we don't want them to be the gatekeepers of, of the metaverse, right? We, so what I think that requires is for musicians, for creators to be a little more adventuresome in, in trying out new, new technologies. It, it, you know, I, I think back to the early days of the internet when you know, just being able to log into a website required you know, a degree from DeVry Institute and, and learning how to code. Uh, and, and now you, you could build a web page, you know, a, a five-year-old could build a web page. But there's often a fear factor here of how do I get on something? And, and, and there's a lot of alternate technologies out there that, that really make it easy to jump into the, the, the deep end of the pool without any risk. So um, I, there are some creators that are really out there on the edge and they're, 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 they're the leading edge, but there's a lot of creators that sit back and wait and see 
what happens. But if you wait too long, then you, you risk having, you know, these gatekeepers, you know, jump in. So, you know, my encouragement to musicians is to do, do some research, spend some time and energy to, to actually find out what this is all about. And, and don't just spend like 30 seconds on Google and give up. Noble, we're going to route you in here real quick. Welcome to the party, if you will. We have a lot of ground to cover. There's a lot that's been happening right now. When we talk about the discussion of music, it means the metaverse. And there's a lot that I'd like to get from your perspective. What is music? Yeah, can you answer me okay? Awesome. We can hear you. Yeah, I mean, I guess there, there's a... There's a lot of scenarios when you start looking at how music in the metaverse is, is, is evolving and, and what things are doing and how things are changing. It's there's so many ways to address this because it's become the great equalizer. And the equalizer is that everyone can now be on the internet, but the reality is it doesn't mean that all their fans are ready for what it means. Right, the biggest issue and the hurdle that we're having and that we've been discovering probably for the last year is that it's more so of getting the fans to understand than it is the uh, musicians because the the fans really don't understand how to even get started, how what the metaverse means to them. Indeed, Mandy, let's switch gears here. Some let's talk about the world of wellness. Let's go into your lens. Let's enter into it. We know a lot of people. For a lot of people, music is not just something for a source of entertainment, or is it something that completely derives towards the idea of community and fanfare? For a lot of people, music is considered healing for whole entire communities and whole entire nations. When you think about music, it has a healing factor to it. It has a binding factor that's just so intimate in so many different relations. Audience that's listening with us today, has music ever been a healing source for you? Has it ever been a factor of comfort that really brings you to a certain level that you feel like you can't really get with other different commodities that are in your life? So when we talk about music and mental wellness, Mandy, open us and bring us into your world, please. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for that question. It's good. And it, it's good. And it's so deep and complex. So I'll try my best to, to give it justice. But um we're wired, uh, our brain is wired for belonging and connection, community, and and also we love storytelling. And so when we hear music or we hear a song or we hear a profound lyric, um, as Stephen said earlier, it expresses the inexpressible and that in and of itself is healing, but it also bonds us to communities, to people who um, like similar things or to open up our eyes to different types of cultures and worlds and and their music and then in that sense it's that universal thing but i want to speak on on behalf of a lot of artists too the lyrics they write the music that they create that is usually coming from some sort of personal experience and when that happens they are creating a healing narrative or a narrative that's expressive for whatever emotional state or mental state that they're in that they felt the need to share with the world. And when, when someone is vulnerable enough to do that and to have the courage to do that and people can hear it and relate, that connection where, oh, me too, that is, that's what creates a lot of the healing property. Like, I don't know if um, any of you have ever thought, man, that song, that's me right now. That's how that feels. And so it's just, it's so much deeper. Um, and, and, and even in my, my work with, with clients, whether they just like music or they're, they're artists in, the, in and of themselves and creators, uh, it, it, creates, uh, it creates their own language, essentially, and a way to be heard without having to to talk about it, um, a way to feel understood in a different type of way and, and can create safety. So in terms of if you're wanting to even help heal your own mental health and your, your emotional well-being and all, all of that, connecting to music that inspires you and music that 
you know, you need to hear for, for energy, for comfort, for whatever it may be, it will, it will bring you into a different emotional state. And, and I would encourage people to use that for good, not bad. Don't always listen to a sad song when you're sad, <laughs> you know, um, and all of that. But it's, um, it's so meaningful on so many levels. And I think especially for the artists who create the music. Absolutely. And let's switch gears over here. We're going to talk a little bit about equality. Rashad, Mr. Driscoll, is it possible to create equal opportunities for artists, producers, and musicians in the metaverse? Wow. Um, yes, it, it, it really is. Um, starting to, I think, Cynthia's point, you know, to look at accessibility, you know, a lot of people still don't have internet. It's become a basic human need at this point, you know, so you have to, you have to start there. And then um, bringing everybody in early on, you know, if, if you're just now looking at the metaverse, you're already late, you know, but uh, again, most people are like, okay, well, I'll, I'll get into it, you know, after the bugs are worked out, <laughs> you know, or, or, or the, you know, I, I've given it some time and then you're just getting further and further and the, the layers of separation become so great that by the time it's time for you to jump in, you're like, wait, what? You know, we need to be teaching our kids about these emerging technologies. You know, there, there's so much information that's accessible at this point you know, that you can go online and learn Unity or Unreal and learn some of these developing programs. But even, you know, if you're if you're just now looking at it, you know, you're late. So so now it's like double up, triple up, triple up. And we can create that level playing field that we've all hoped for for the last, you know, however many years. And so we've become more virtual in the past. We have become more virtual in the past 28 months than we have the past 28 years. Right. And we're not going back. Virtual is here. The metaverse is ascending, if you will. Communities are congregating together digitally and virtually, unlike ways we've ever seen before. We have fathomed this. We just didn't think they would happen this early. Russell, Mad Bob, let's go and start talking about the things that you're doing and leveraging when it comes to the impact of music and the metaverse. How do you plan on or are doing making a difference or impact in the metaverse concerning music? Yeah, um, good question. Um, <laughs> there's, um, when it comes to impact of music in the metaverse, um, I think it's all about um, bringing people together. Like that's, I think that's kind of like the underlining principle to it all. Um, so when you're, when musicians are being able to onboard their fans into the metaverse and bringing them into the virtual world. Um, I think that step is very important in making sure that they they learn that and being able to teach that and, and being able to make it more easy and accessible, like Cynthia said before, of, of them being able to be onboarded into the metaverse space. Um, I think, um, sorry, am I, am I asking the question correct or am I just rambling on <laughs> keep on <going. laughs> um i was just making sure um yeah i think um i think also there's a there's a long way to go um on the metaverse side too um because you know the, the whole uh you know the, the way in which i try to make it into kind of like this this one whole metaverse now especially with like uh with uh was it Microsoft and all that? They've invested into one combined massive investment firm to try and create this whole one uh, kind of metaverse, and and then also Meta doing the same thing. Um, I think that's going to be maybe potentially a, a a big issue, and maybe potentially stop musicians from even getting into there because of those and, and putting the barriers in the way. Um, but at this early stage, um, I definitely think musicians have great opportunities to be able to leverage. Uh, leverage, leverage it with their fans that they currently got, basically, and, and bringing them into that world, and then start being able to monetize that, and also growing their own communities and establishing that. Um, I just think that they need to just kind of teach them how to do it. And sometimes, if you find the correct metaverse, because there's a lot of different metaverses. For instance, like Crypto Voxels is a good one because it allows you to not only allow users to uh, experience it with not being logged in, like as in having your own MetaMask wallet and stuff like that, but also allows people who are in the Web3 to be able to experience the whole thing. So something like that allows both sides to experience the metaverse and crypto voxels are definitely doing that well. And I think if they continue doing that and, and continue making it accessible for everybody, then more and more people will be onboarded and then the more mass adoption will happen. 
Yes, indeed. Thank you, Russell. And to our audience, for those that are just tuning in, welcome to the global sound of community in the metaverse. We have such an assembly of different people that are contributing towards this thoughts and all the way around how we might look at it through the eyes of accessibility, education, equality, community, safety, privacy, and wellness. This is an open one. Whoever has it, has it. Do any of you see yourselves as pioneers in the metaverse as it relates to music and are willing to take the challenge of helping develop this frontier? And if so, how? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'll jump in really quick if you guys can hear me okay. Uh, yeah, we see ourselves as pioneers because the, the goal was very simple. People really don't know how money is made in the music industry uh, at all. They don't understand royalties. They don't understand sync licensing. They don't understand mechanicals. They don't understand streaming. They don't understand how uh, music can generate a certain amount of money uh, for two or three years and then the song dies off. They don't really comprehend that um, uh, one song is almost like a movie. There may be 12 to 15 people producing a song whether it's the engineers, the producers, the writers, and we just look at the face of the performing artist and make the assumption that, you know, uh, Jay-Z or Beyonce or whomever is really the end-all be-all for that song, but there's a lot of people who are behind the scenes and crafted it. So because I've been in the music industry since the 90s, you know, I came across my original press and distribution contract the other day cleaning my office. I had my first P&D deal in 1997 through uh, Mercury Private Eye, which later became Universal Private Eye. And I read a little book called uh, Everything You Need to Know About the Music Industry Back Then. Uh, it was a great book that really broke down how royalties existed. And that really got me into owning and buying music royalties and giving advances. But there's some real fatal flaws in the music industry that cannot be brought over into the metaverse. One of those core fatal flaws is the idea that royalties don't matter. And the reason why I say that is that, unfortunately, banks will not lend to performers on the royalties that they generate. And what that's done is it's created a really toxic environment in which, quote unquote, the VCs of the music industry, the Sonys, the Universals, the Warner Brothers, have fully exploited popular artists and writers and producers to the point of where it's almost like slave labor. The fact that they actually give advances on the royalties that people are about to generate and then also keep almost 85% of the money and force the artist to pay back on 15% was unheard of in any other VC environment but yet the music industry has operated and functioned that way for the last hundred years. And so bringing that toxic environment into the metaverse is one of the number one things that our goal has been able uh, to be able to fight, that we want artists to be fully comprehending that it's not tenable to stream your music at zero, zero, one cent and have to have 30 million spins before you earn a minimum wage of $36,000 a year that your music does have value. You know, I think Mandy was trying to get alluding to the point of how the music is so significant. And, you know, someone said it best, music is the soundtrack of our lives. And yet the artists that perform it and the people that are writing it and the people that are producing it functionally are in deep poverty and don't have any kind of future income established for them because they have to borrow from their future in order to live today. So the fancy cars, the fancy homes and the like are all based on them giving up their future royalty in order to be able to sustain and live a lifestyle mm -hmm. far and above their means. And if that, that's if they're lucky. And so the metaverse and the idea of it is meant to get people the opportunity to, and we believe we're pioneering this, that you are better off having 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 dedicated fans as opposed to being part of a grist mill that will shove you out to millions of people who do not value your work. And we know that this is a problem because the major labels are now creating their own music playlists and then doing work for hire and copycatting music that sounds similar to artists that are performing so that the major labels can maintain and keep most of the money off of the streaming and bit by bit push the current artists who are trying to be innovative and creative outside the streaming cycle. 
So there's this very nefarious thing going on utilizing both streaming and radio that is bit by bit eliminating creativity. And the only way to sustain and grow creativity will be the metaverse. And we believe with the way we've created our first ever music NFT exchange, the first ever uh, multi-track uh, blockchain products, we're filing a patent on that, and the ability to teach the fans and even the musicians that this is how the money's made and how you parse it out and how you break it up and how you tap into sync is really the key. So long before we talk about fixing the digital divide, because we've been talking about that since Clinton and Al Gore, we have to figure out a way to create some sustainability for the artists themselves and for them to personally value the music that they have and be willing to go with less fans and earn more as opposed to being part of a system that just does not work. So let's open it up. Let's talk about that sustainability, humanity. Let's talk about the beneficiary, the beneficiary, the bit beneficiaries, excuse me, tongue tied, the beneficiaries of music itself. Let's put this in perspective some restaurants, music, your local cafe, music, your living room, music, the workplace, amusement, amusement parks, music, nightclubs, music, bars, music. Music goes the distance with us. Road trips, flying, walking, jogging, ear pods, Apple pods, Sony headphones, whatever headphones you just bought on Amazon last week during Prime Week. Music has been with us. It stays with us. It's sometimes with our first kiss, our first lovers. Some people are conceived in music, different topic altogether. When we talk about music, it goes with us. But let's talk about the beneficiaries when it comes to music. So I open it up. Panel, who do you perceive will be the biggest beneficiaries to music in the metaverse? Fans, artists, labels, or? Well, if I may, um, I want to expand on what Noble was saying. Um, and I, I can't disagree with anything other than the 0 0.001 cent. It's actually higher than that, but still pretty low. Um, so Web 2.0 taught us a great word, disintermediation, right? DIY, do it yourself, direct to fan. And, it, and it, we, we, we have at our fingertips now a great system where creators can control the flow of money that results from their, their, their creation, right? It, there are some benefits to signing up with a label, no doubt. There's some benefits to signing up with an artist, a manager, producers, but never before has the channels for the flow of compensation been, been clearer and more direct. Now, it is an educational issue. You know, most people do not know the flow of money. And that's how I taught myself how I transitioned from a film composer to a music business person. So um, the Web 3.0 is now taking that concept of disintermediation even further, right? So with the metaverse, and if we avoid the gatekeepers, the metas, the Amazons, the the, the um the Googles, and we use people like Madbop or Ban Royalty. You know, if we if we can utilize these technologies, then the beneficiaries are the creators, and it's a more direct fan to creator connection than ever before. And and I think who benefits? You know, people who are involved with the creation, and it could be artists, it could be labels, it could be um, it could be distributors. It's anybody in the food chain that wants to create a more direct connection with the people who are consuming and using and enjoying music and the people who are providing that, making it possible. But Stephen, when I hear this, let's leap on to Cynthia and let's think about this for a second. We're talking money. Let's talk about money. How do we create money-making opportunities in the metaverse as it relates to music in a humane way? I, I say that, let's back that up some. It's because we know that piracy is a big deal. It has been for some time in music. Uh, artists have lost their livings based on privacy. And we're not just going to specifically look at Napster. Some say that places like Spotify and Apple Music, it's not enough. It's not enough for me to make. Back in the day, day, in 90s, 80s, 70s, a musician would get a gold album or a platinum album. They were up. They were going way high. 
the more advancement of technology has come out, for some musicians, it's been really bad. Because All right, well, you know, Chris, you can't well, do that. You, well, you but I was going to say, to, to that point, though, even those platinum artists were losing money. You had right. TLC who went multi-platinum and filed bankruptcy the next year. Sure. The system is not about the artists. It's about what happens with the people they sign up to give them advances. And to further my point, Stephen, it's only recently Pandora only pays 0. 0.0013. You have YouTube Music, which pays 0. 0.008. Spotify, right. 0. 0.003. These are facts that can be looked up. So your dispute of what I said still doesn't change the fact that people have to stream so much in order to generate a thousand dollars that they yeah, don't so have this to. Is, so noble, this is my point. Thousand, but, but Stephen, let me, Stephen let, me, let me interject with this and say this. This is my point. That we look at the times where money was made differently when it comes to music. They're the annuals of time. But when we start to look at the progress of technology, for some way there's a benefit because you get more visibility as an independent music. Independent musicians have never had greater visibility than they do today. Those are facts. Exactly. On the flip side of that, on the flip side of that, when we start to look at musicians to Noble's point, 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0 point, this, that, and the other, and all the other numbers that he just gave, so many musicians are missing out and they feel like they're getting cheap. And when they hear about the incoming avid rise of the acceleration of the metaverse, they start to say, is the metaverse going to be a place where I can make money in a humane, sustainable, and healthy way? Stephen, Cynthia, what do you have? Yes, I, I, I agree. It, it, it's possible. It, it, but, you know, when you look back to the old music economy and you signed to a label, you got in advance and you sold a whole lot of physical product or digital product, still most artists made much, much more money, 10 times, 20 times touring, merchandise, and other forms of, of <clears throat> revenue. And there was a lot, many, many artists did not survive on their on the sale of their music, even historically. So no. I think it's a fallacy to look back and say, well, artists did make out in those, in those situations. Sure. And, and, and nowadays, you know, it, it's, it's, you can't ignore the user, the consumer, and, and their preference. And the preference is clearly access over ownership. So you have to create other revenue models, other revenue streams than Spotify, Pandora, YouTube. You know, you have... As and, an audience, we have to look at Live Nation, Stephen. I'm sorry? Live, Na Live Nation caused a lot of these problems. Exactly. You're they introduced absolutely the right. idea of a 360 deal in which they right. would own a piece of all the merchandise, a piece of all the, the touring, right. a piece of everything... So they could write you a check for $5 million. People who had nothing or people who were artists. So I'll take the five or $10 million again, leasing and selling off their future for right. now. Madonna, but, Madonna but, did that deal and, and barely saw any additional monies, you know, after exactly. That. And she was one but, of the first well, deals. I just want to jump in because let, let's, let's bring this into the web three world, right? Because we're talking about old kind of styles here. What about like, the modern times like i'm thinking especially kind of like you know when you're saying about cds and stuff like that that's the equivalent to nfts now right someone can sell an nft for ten dollars which would be the equivalent of twenty thousand streams for example so nfts are a key part into the metaverse but not only that but also the old models can still be used inside the metaverse such as like live streaming can also still be done inside the metaverse and people can still pay royalties for that because it's been streamed inside the metaverse. I know that because I've done events inside the metaverse where we've done that. So yeah, which is great, which is great, Russell. But this is the problem. Yeah. You can't devoid one without the other, and this is the the fallacy of logic that we can automatically jump into the new space and then automatically it makes sense. Most of that is still being controlled by the major corporations. If you want access and you want to drive, there's this confusion in the idea that just because someone has a million followers on TikTok and a million followers on YouTube and the like, that that translate into buyers and spends. There still needs to be an so. investment in marketing and promotion. And so the yeah. reality is that the who has the biggest marketing dollars is always going to be the major corporations. And that's why but the domination of the metaverse will be them. If we're not but let me interject here when it comes to this. So we're talking music. OK, that's fine. We know the stats for them when it comes to that. But we're heading in a new frontier. This is uncoveted ground where all the stats, all exactly. the data means about this much right now. Because right. when we start going into hyper-realistic, immersive, simulated environments, 
And we start to ingress into environments where we start to deal with the ecologically an environment that's virtual and communication environments and interactive. We're not just no longer purchasing CDs, tapes and Spotify and Apple. We're not necessarily just listening and putting our headphones on. Now we're interacting with our music in the animate economy and the animate world in ways we've never even considered, but it's here. Mm -hmm. When the earth is now machine readable, when we have cloud AR and we have virtual reality and we have extended reality in ways that we never even consider to interact with that, with hologramic projections and all the things that come with that, we need to start thinking about how do we have cr true sustainability on this new medium, on yes. this new level where record labels and independent artists alike are trying to figure this out from what I certainly hear, it even apps like Spotify and Apple fear a bit of disruption towards what they've been enjoying with their healthy profits for some time, what they're looking at. Cynthia, chime in. What are we looking at? You know, at? yeah, so much good stuff going on here. I think that the key is to look at the metaverse as another venue. So if you create spaces, you create venues in metaverse platforms, and there's lots of them out there, as we know, not just one or two big ones, mm -hmm. lots of them. And you can create a space where artists can come and do their show, sell their merch. You know, NFTs are merch, right? So what if you did 10 versions of the same song? And you minted each version and then people collect all your versions of that song. I mean, there's just so many ways to creative ways to get to that point of of empowering a, an independent musician. There's always going to be DIYers and those that would just rather let others do the work. But if a, if a person who just wants to hand off all the responsibility to someone else feels like they could do it and really, you know, we want to make money. It's not the only reason we're doing music, though. I hope so. Some, I hope it is. Some, some people don't have, <laughs> don't have, you know, uh, money in mind. You know, there's a lot of sort of trust fund babies and people who have money or other jobs that pay them really well. And they're just doing music for the love of it. And they let other people take the benefits, take the, the rewards, you know, the profits. Maybe that's not a great thing, but there's plenty to go around. There's plenty to go around. There's plenty of places and people to do these so, things. And if so, more so. people feel like they're empowered and have the access to the technology right. and the, and the right. equipment to do these things and they, and there's education out there. Okay. Here's another metaverse space. Learn how to do your own NFTs or your own metaverse space, you know, give that education away for free. I got a couple things just to address that. You know, you've been talking a lot. I know a lot of people listening right now. Adrian, let's jump into this real quick because we got a lot of ground to track. Please. Several questions to go. How does music, the metaverse, because we're talking about NFTs, the audience, for those that may not know, NFTs, non fungible tokens, a lot of people are under the impression that NFTs are new. They're not. They're emerging and they're in the eco habitat. They've been around for some time. BitDNS, Counterparty, Colored Coins, Ethereum, so forth and so on. 720 standards, ERC, 1155. We can go into firm details, but we're not going to go too deep into that right now. What I do want to know, because we've been using this word NFTs, we see it happening in the world. We see a crypto winter happening right now, and there's been a great deep recession that looks like it's happening with non-fungible tokens. But... On the flip side, it's very volatile. We knew what we were signing up for in the crypto asset space and Web3, and they're going up. Some people have benefited to this day immensely with NFTs. Some haven't been so fortunate. Let's marry this together, Adrian. How does music, the metaverse, and NFTs relate to one another? And does this union produce community? Well, I mean, so... <laughs> there's so many ways I can go with this. I'm still kind of buzzing off what everyone else is saying. So yes, these can all create community. One, they can all create a sustainable income for you. You know, um, you got to get past the nonsense. You know, people see board apes and people see all the big ones and they're like, oh, I want to do that. Yeah, everybody wants to do that, <laughs> you know. But, you know, um, I, I think my, my business partner, Young Guru, he had a great statement. He's like, I sell Jay-Z albums and we don't make, you know, uh, we don't sell, make a million dollars per minute. 
you know, so um, the, the thing is, you have to look at what is the utility, who's buying this. And when you look at these metaverse platforms, and I, I think a lot of people on here are going to disagree with me. But hey, look, go where the people are. Everyone's afraid of Meta. Everyone's afraid of Microsoft. Go ahead and look. If you go to Dave's uh, metaverse platform over here and has eight people, you're not <laughs> making any money. You, you have to be able to monetize this, okay? This is a rare opportunity to have someone do one performance. Uh, this is an avatar hologram. You did one performance, right? This is your touring. Now, you did that one performance, and you can continue to play it again and again. Music, the audio only, has now become visual, okay? So now you can apply a movie model to music. That is a rare, rare, rare opportunity mm -hmm. for an artist, You've never, you've never heard that before, right? Nope, no, no, no. Adrian, I want to throw this to Noble because I know we have a bit of heritage on this stage and people that have been in this real quick. And briefly, will you, will you, will you, will you journey with us on a second with this for Noble? I have to ask because Stephen and Noble, I'll open this up to you and whoever else may want to chime in on this. We talk about the history. Hey, we're saying, hey, maybe it's a fallacy to think that back in the day, people were making more money than they were now. Perhaps it's a fallacy and it's just like, where'd you conjure that from? Fine. Here's my question to this. With your lens perspective and what you're looking at, does the event rise in the incoming of the metaverse? Is this a good thing for the music industry? So uh, let me, I'll, 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 I'll take this. Thank you, Cynthia. I've been talking a lot because I'm quite knowledgeable about the space. And for the last 30 years, I've been both in the music and in the investment space. The worst thing that's happened in the metaverse has been the rush to bring in VC capital. So bringing in BlackRock, bringing in A1 Ventures, bringing in all these major corporations, which ride the fence on both sides, are forcing this idea of these protective walled gardens that it's creating these de facto metaverse, quote unquote, labels in which the people that they handpick that they want in their walled garden to, to Adrian's point, where the traffic is, is where they're going to make their stars and they'll be creating the exact same deals. The vision of this being so easy uh, for trust fund babies and people who just want to make music, we it costs us almost fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars to mint an F NFT contract. Sometimes five thousand to mint an NFT contract for NFTs when Ethereum was at its height, going where the people are. Right, everyone does Ethereum. They don't do Solana. They don't do Cardano. They don't do Tron. So this idea that it's just easy and magnanimous to be able to do is, is a fallacy in and of itself. OpenSea is not an open exchange. It's first of all, it doesn't even make contracts. And if they decide to shut you off, they can shut your contracts off at any given time. So the, we have to be very, very cautious with the idea that this is a open playing field because it really bit by bit is not being coming open. These ideas of these immersive environments, it costs me on average a quarter million dollars to half a million dollars to build small immersive environments. I've been building programs for the last six years. I got into this 2016, 2017, when CryptoKitties was first creating NFTs. And so these ideas that these great places that are immersive and it's great, you need programmers to do all that. You need the ability to fund and finance that. And we have to go to, unfortunately, angel VCs. And that's what's going to make this next phase, particularly in the crypto winter, be very scary because the main capital, the institutional capital is now taking over where private capital once was, where the individual investors were. And that's going to make it very difficult for individuals to succeed. So to Adrian's point, you've got to move now. If you want to be a participant, you have to be in now. And so th th that's my two cents. So it's a very dangerous environment. Individuals and, and private Dave's metaverse is not going to succeed in an environment that they don't have the eyeballs. Thank well, you, Noble. I Steven, let me throw this caveat on there. Thank you so much, Noble. Let me add this in. 2030, the projection for many credible references and resources 2030, the metaverse is slated to be a $13 trillion plus mm -hmm. economy. Think about that for a second. We've never seen this type of accelerated growth and advancement in emerging technologies ever to the annuals of time, especially contemporary to our time. $13 trillion slated dollars. What benefit might the music industry get from that? And going back to the original question, is the metaverse necessarily good for the music industry? Well, well I, I have to say, I've been getting projections 
ever since you know 1990. <laughs> and and I, I've taught a lot of classes. I've had a lot of slides and charts. And I could say without hesitation, no projection has ever been accurate. And I'm, and I'm going back 20, 30 years. And so I would not put any weight into that 13 trillion. If it's 1 trillion, I would be thrilled, right? But, but 13 trillion, I would just say that that's like trying to calculate how many extant alien civilizations. But Stephen, let's, let's add this in too, though. But right. many projections have been wrong, but some projections have been wrong, not in a negative sense. Some forecasts have had the numbers blow completely out the well, water in those hey, past yeah. 30 years. Facts. Well, well that's, that's true. But you know, I, I want to make Stephen. a distinction here. When people talk about Web3, the metaverse, and NFTs, they group them all together, right? It, they're not the same thing. The, you know, mm -hmm. the, the metaverse and NFTs are different products, let's say, different, different music economies. And in, in the metaverse, you don't have to rely on crypto. You can rely on cash, on, on, on money. And, and what, I, what I think is the biggest challenge that's facing our, you know, the music industry is that it historically, and even now music is so undervalued by the users, the consumers, they think they, they cherish music. They can't live a day without their music, but you ask them to pay nine 99 a month and they go, Whoa, that's too much, you know, for, for 50 million tracks. Uh, so there's a constant battle to add value to what should be valuable in and of itself. And the metaverse, in my opinion, is the next phase in that. We're adding the visceral in immersive experience just to maintain the value of music to encourage people to share their hard-earned money with, with the creators that they love and share. So I do think the metaverse is going to be very beneficial it, it, as a natural extension of, create, of trying to create the true value of music that it, it should have. Mandy, let's switch the notes some here. And thank you, Stephen, so much. You're and welcome. Google and Adrian. And let's switch it up a little bit. Let's talk about wellness. Let's get sure, Let's talk about group dynamics, because that would be fun, too. <laughs> Just kidding. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, so, and it, well, I want to interject a few things. And even just hearing everybody talk about all this. And I, I am probably of everyone on this panel, actually, no, ev everyone on this panel, I mean, I know some, but I'm probably the most ignorant about all the, the technicalities of that stuff, right? But what I have known about the music industry before is in terms of the nature of it, that there's a lot of toxicity out there. There's a lot of things that happen uh, that people feel obligated to do or whatever it may be. Um, in toxic ways that I'm hoping some of this more online stuff can course correct. With that being said, everybody's going to have to be their own advocate and they're going to have to do their research. And if something doesn't feel right, always trust your gut because lots of new and upcoming mus musicians and artists get taken advantage of a lot. And so it's something to be aware of with that. Um, and the other the other concern in regards to wellness is that for a lot of artists that um, on stage piece, there's a transfer of energy that happens. There's the interaction with the audience that happens when you're in real time people that I think um, artists are going to have to find ways to get their that energy need met that feeding off the crowd, that bond that you get from in person. Um, and so that's, and while they're, you know, the live audience and all of that is great. I mean, that's still there, but it is different. And that plays a different psychological role in your music and in what's going to may or may not create burnout if there's less satisfaction from being on an actual in-person stage. And so I think everybody needs to be aware of their own, you know, artists, creators, producers, whatever their own, um, their own mental health needs and how do you know when you're getting burnt out? How do you know it when uh, something feels off and do you have the support that you need in all of this? Because this is a very 
you know, while all, any, well, first of all, anything new is going to be difficult and scary and all of that. And so it's easy to be susceptible to things that may or may not be in your best interest. Um, and everyone's the expert on themselves. And so, and our, our gut has its own nervous system. And so your body picks up on things before it makes it to your mind. So I would, in terms of wellness, I would want everyone to check in with themselves about how this is really going and you know, for themselves in the, you know, in the artist world, in the um, performing world, all of that. Um, and there was one other point I was going to have that. Oh, and secondly, um, so we, during the pandemic, we got more connected than we ever got before online, right? In terms of schools and uh, the workplace, all of that. Also, mental health uh, issues have quadrupled since that time. Now, some of that was from the pandemic and all the things that were going on with all of that. However, um, lack of real-time human connection is something to be aware of. You know, when we are in person with someone, we we release oxytocin. It's the bonding chemical. While I can connect with you virtually, I'm not getting that right now. And and there's all other things that I hope in the um, in terms of the wellness category of the metaverse and being online, that there are people in place, myself included, who can provide education on what happens, what can happen when you're over when when you're, you stay in the metaverse too long without actually staying in your reality world, you know, as well and having that balance with that because how our brains are wired, this is, our, our minds are gonna have to adapt to this. We're gonna have to adapt and we have been adapting to it. Um, but there's um, lots of things that would take too long for me to get into all of them right now, but that people um, should be aware of in terms of, um, checking in on their mental health around all of this. Thank you, Mandy. The panel, yeah. I have a question and it's a bit expansive and f f walk with me here, um, suffer it to be so please. So Woodstock, Lollapalooza, House of Blues, Showtime at the Apollo, a, a venue that you may know of, Coco Cabana, all different types of concerts that are out there, reading festival, outside lands here in San Francisco, so many other different venues. Uh, through time, some of these venues have come alive because of fandom, the music, the facility, the meaning, the intimacy of a of, of, of venue. Uh, the way that we listen to music, the way that we've interacted has changed in a lot of ways. We've went from reel to reel to vinyl, which some of us still have, to tape, to cassette, to CD, to uh, digital iTunes, and then we go to the Spotify's of the world or Pandora for exploration and Apple music, so forth and so on. My question is this with the avid rise of the metaverse, and we can even throw web three in there because they two are just separate as uh, Steven, you're absolutely right. Web three operates within the metaverse. When we start to look at this transition, this change, do we have a hope for something different that we've never seen really before amplified because of the metaverse and the greater democratization of tools and access, are we going to see new manifestations of music in a different way with all that we see happening uh, in leverage with Web3 and the metaverse? I open this up to everyone. Please. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Yes. And <laughs> this this goes just about what, what Mandy was saying, which I agree with everything you just said, literally. And I rarely say that. So, <laughs> um, but like one, you're getting rid of the toxicity. I appreciate that. Yeah, you're getting rid of the toxicity uh, to an extent because you can get creators who don't have a ton of money. You can get people who are doing tutorials and look, I want to help you build this space. That's it. And you let the artists be artists, right? And now you have a true ability to have the hybrid approaches now, right? You can have the live performance, right? And you then you can have a, 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 an extension and we've done this, you know, um, that's in the metaverse and you let people the consumers consume. Some people don't want to be in big crowds. You know, some venues can't hold a, a huge amount of people. You know, some people can't afford to go and build out their dream 
their dream experience, this is how music expands. You're giving people true ability to have a hybrid experience. Pick how you consume this. That's that's what I think as consumers we want. I don't want you to tell me how to go. I want to go how I want to. Got it. Can I can I can I jump on this as well, Christopher? Um, yeah, it's very interesting as well because obviously um, I'm on the event side and um, yeah, um, when it comes to kind of the 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 event kind of point of view, um, it saves a lot of costs as well for artists to be able to create their things. But not only that, but also it gives savings to fans too because they don't have to fly there. They don't have to book a hotel. They don't have to do like all these multiple different steps just to go and visit their favorite artists, right? They can just experience it as if they were in person inside the metaverse. And I think that is the huge big difference there because basically it literally opens you up worldwide without even having to have you know, everyone in just some, you know, building or venue, whatever. And not only that, but you can also create, you can be very creative in how you create your venue. You can even replicate, like, the O2 arena and replicate it inside your own metaverse and your own space. And th there are costs, obviously, obviously, to that. Like, you have to get the land, like, you'd have to purchase the land and stuff first, or you can lease that from someone else if you want to, and then kind of do it that way. But... And then you also got like builders who specifically build like the buildings as well. If you can hire in, if you need to do so as well. But from the artist point of view and just being like artistic and, and being able to kind of create your music and, and kind of do what you want and create your own merch and stuff like that, you can be as crazy as you want. And I think that's what's so magical about the, the metaverse and, and the NFT space and just the whole kind of web three space in general. And I'm, I'm a massive fan of it. I, I, I love it. And I think it's definitely just going to revolutionize like the whole of the music industry, whether you're a musician with a big label, independent, whatever. I think it's going to give artists that power back. And that is what we needed in the music industry so badly. So that's my two cents. And as we come to a conclusion, I want to go round Revan to each speaker to allow them to at least tell us, because this has been a very insightful, which we couldn't have gone a whole nother hour for, especially with Noble and Stephen having so much to say and so much regard to the times past, if you will, compared to now, Cynthia. But what we want to do is we want to find ways for people to connect with you afterward. So we'll go to speaker to speaker real quick. In a quick 20 seconds, if you will, tell us what you do and how people can get a hold of you. Start with Russell, please. Sure. Um, so my company is called Madbop. It's uh, madbop.events is our website. Um, basically, we're a metaverse events company. Um, and so if you, you can basically just go onto there, you know, click to have a consultation or whatever. Um, or you can email me personally if you want to. If you have any questions, it's uh, russell at madbop.com. Noble. Yeah, I think we're definitely reaching out to you, Russell. I, my name is Noel Dracone. I, it's easy to find me on LinkedIn. We have uh, uh, two projects, bandroyalty.com, where we sold uh, NFTs that allowed people to share in music royalties. And we also have our uh, marketplace exchange called bandnfts.com, in which we take independent artists and show them how to make the NFTs and target their own customers. Thank you. Cynthia. Yeah, um, you can contact me at uh, my LinkedIn profile, which is um, Cynthia with an S and then Cynthia with a C, <laughs> P. Um, you can also email me, Cynthia with an S at CynthiaPayne.com, Cynthia with an S, Cynthia with S. Um, and for the past 15 years or so, I have been very avid participant, coach, uh, per performer, uh, producer uh, for or with uh, using the Jack Trip software, which enables musicians to connect and play together in low latency, uncompressed, high quality, concert quality audio sessions, music sessions. Adrian, real quick. Yeah. Um, so yeah, my, my company, Collimation, we produce experiences um, anywhere from AR, VR, uh, 2D metaverse experiences, even some audio. Um, we work with the biggest artists in the world down to the smallest indie. You know, we, we want to create something that's going to be impactful. Um, Adrian Rashad Driscoll across all platforms. Find me on LinkedIn. Let's have a chat. Steven. Yeah, hi, I'm president of Viewpoint Consulting Services. I'm an executive consultant in the music business. Uh, my current clients include uh, made in Memphis Entertainment, where I, I run their operations and business affairs for their distribution arm. 
Uh, I also work with uh, a, a new metaverse company. I can't divulge who that is. Indie artists and um, you know a, a lot of emerging companies. So uh, I can be reached. Uh, I'll give you my my short email because my company name is too long. But scorn100 at gmail.com is my short email. But I'm on LinkedIn as well. 